Okay, I guess um, we'll get, uh, get started. And um, so anyway, we'll get, uh, get going now. So um, if Agalos is ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay, um, right, I just got to um, let you know in advance, this is, um, actually I know this is sort of advertised as 60 minutes, um, but it's actually probably going to be about a 30 minute uh, presentation instead of 60. So um, a combination of this one and the other one took rather longer than uh, I'd expected. Plus uh, my partner was not very keen on me working on the presentation past 1 a.m. last night, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so I'll just uh, introduce myself. Um, I'm Ian Jameson, uh, originally from Canada, been living in London since uh, about the year 2000, been working with FileMaker since the mid 90s. And um, I initially used it, um, I was consulting on client server financial systems and um, I was using it to transform data when we um, did system migrations. And then somehow after that, I found myself working on a FileMaker product in the education market where we had about 20,000 customers. Um, so anyway, uh, basically formed Transforming Digital a couple of years ago. And what we're working on right now is sort of a product that's using ML to try and generate insights from, uh, from meetings. And um, sort of when I'm not uh, doing that, I enjoy hiking and uh, sort of doing track days and that type of thing in uh, in my car. Who is that? A person or a dog? Or? That's my partner. She's just covering her uh, eyes. <laughs> I took one of the teams. This is um. <laughs> this is uh. <laughs> that, 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 was, that was taken on the uh, the Prescott Hill Climb um, race circuit in. Um, Ooh, just yeah, outside Cheltenham in, uh, in England. So what you can see is that just at the edge of the grass there, there's like a giant drop off down to... <laughs> she managed to hide. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to talk about message queues. Um, uh, basically, queues transmit, it, transmit messages from a producer to a consumer. So the producer can be, can be just about any piece of software. And a message queue, uh, if, if you viewed it as a sort of um, really highly available, really, really fast database that's been designed um, to, well, most of them are, are designed not as databases, but essentially to be just incredibly reliable. Most of them basically support, um, uh, basically, I'm going, going blank here, <laughs> but, um, you know, sort of um, not sharding, but um, multiple multiple servers together, clustering. clustering thank you. <laughs> it's getting too late in the day. <laughs> so most of them support clustering. So things like RabbitMQ, uh, which is quite a popular one, supports clustering. Uh, Amazon SQS, uh, Simple Queue service, is another one. And that, well, whatever Amazon does behind the scenes, that's incredibly available and and fast and scalable beyond belief. Um, so essentially, the, basically, the messages come into this queue and then the consumer reads them. From a technical perspective, um, we're going to we can get better performance from systems, increased reliability, um, because, well, I'm sure, actually, while well, Jan's talk yesterday was talking about sort of... Um, uh, sorry, scripting queues in FileMaker. Um, but what we can do with, um, with message queues is that we don't need to worry about the availability of the system we want to talk to if we're communicating between two systems. We communicate the message queue and then the other system is communicated with sort of as and when is necessary. It makes things scalable in a really granular manner. So what we can do is let's say we've got something that needs to process images. If we've got too many images to process in real time or close to real time or an acceptable time, what we can do is we can add more consumers to process images. So rather than having one machine processing images, we could have two or three or, or scale up to whatever number. <laughs> we, 
we needed. And it, 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 simple, it makes things much simpler to decouple systems. If you think about when we had to do integration from FileMaker via um, things like ESS or ODBC, uh, ESS in particular, it's really, really fragile. Um, that if anything changes in the other system, it's likely to break the integration. Whereas message queues kind of add that sort of an intermediate stage that can sort of mediate between those, those type of changes. From a business perspective, we can end up with improvements sort of to the kind of the, what are usually the, the core business uh, operations management ob objectives, things like quality and speed, reliability, flexibility, and cost. So as I go through some of the examples, I'll sort of show how we can see some of the benefits from those. And so um, basically, one of the things when I first looked at message queues was, I guess the question is, what is a message? And the answer is basically it can be just about anything. Generally, it's text-based, some kind of text-based to object. Um, in general, it's going to be probably JSON. That's, that's what I've been using for most of my messages, passing JSON back and forth because everything speaks it. So um, queues can, when, when a producer sends a message to a queue, the queue can push that out to a consumer, and that's basically sort of a publish and subscribe type of, type of model. The can, consumer can pull, where the, in this case, messages will sit in the queue until the consumer asks for or pulls for messages. So really that, yeah, the, the difference push and pull there. Um, we can have, use a queue to decouple systems. So we can have system one basically sending messages to a queue that are going to be consumed by a second system. Um, this also actually could work with, for example, if we had FileMaker systems sort of inside inside an organization's firewall and FileMaker systems outside, that that could be used as a way of passing messages without needing to punch a hole through the firewall for port 5003 or having the two FileMaker systems communicating directly. And we can distribute processing. So we can basically scale to have multiple consumers from a message queue, depending on what we're trying to do. So if you look at some use cases, um, one of the things we might want to do is alter the timing of the processing. So let's say we've got a, a, a message. If we use an example where we're processing images where we're, or video where we need to rescale images or change the resolution, that type of thing. Basically, the producer would send the message into the message queue saying, this job needs to be done to this file, and we can delay the timing. So the consumers don't need to do that right away. They can do it sort of at their leisure. And the question is, why would you want to do this? And this is an example where you can get really large cost savings. That if we're doing the processing with Amazon, if we were using EC2 instances, the difference in cost between an on-demand instance, I've just taken a couple of examples, but you can see an A1 large, so that it's five cents per hour, the on-demand hourly rate. But if you use AWS spot instances, you can see it's um, roughly 80% cheaper. So spot instances are a type of instance that AWS provide that Essentially, when people have got excess compute capacity, they can sell it back to Amazon, or Amazon will sell it on for it, resell it for them. And it's at a big discount to normal, com normal compute costs. And I mean, I know these examples are quite low priced, simply because they're at the top of the list. But if someone's got quite high compute costs with EC2 instances, which can happen very, very easily, you know, an 80% saving will be really, really the thing is that with the spot instances you don't have guaranteed availability so what that means is you might be using this instance whereas the person who's who's reserved it and owns it 
basically, if they say, oh, I kind of need it back, basically, you're just going to get shut off. So you're, whatever you're doing will not get finished. So that's kind of the, that's why there's an 80% discount on it. But anyway, what that means is that you can use message queues to save money on that type of processing if you've got very large volumes of compute going on. Um, this is a use case from a company where I used to work where um, they didn't use message queues, but what I'll do, it, it, it'll illustrate some of the problems that can happen that could have been solved fairly easily by message queues if one of the other companies involved had been a little more cooperative. So um, we were company A. We had um, Bank B, which was a major high street bank in the UK, and we were produce, uh, printing out their bank statements um, and all of the communications, marketing communications. Company X is a company you may have heard of whose name starts with X and ends in X. Um, who made a lot of printers <laughs> and copying machines. But they also have a, they, basically what they do is they do a lot of document processing at really large volumes for large organizations. So what would basically the bank would do is basically they would send customer data to company X on their systems where it would go into a secure storage uh, facility, come some kind of storage vault that was very difficult to work with um, and not very full featured. They'd also send us some information about what needed to get sent out. Uh, our systems would then basically reach out and read the data files from this system, combine with the data we got, do the processing, and produce PDF documents. Um, lots of PDF documents. Um, basically, on a weekly basis, we could be talking, you know, when at peak times, basically, we would be talking sort of hundreds of thousands if not over a million documents, which basically were joined into uh, batches of extremely large, sort of, you know, 100,000 pages. So you've got enormous PDF documents, which would get sent off to company X's systems, where they basically have got some kind of high volume printing thing. I don't know exactly know how all that works, but basically they would do the high volume printing or emailing of those, uh, those documents. So, big problem we had that they were not very keen on helping us with was when we found out that the, um, the bank had sent documents to their storage vault, um, we had no way of knowing when they were sent. Um, essentially, they, they basically would upload them and then at some point in the day, and the way we did it was, we basically said, if you guys have got everything uploaded by five o'clock, we'll process it at 5.15 or 5.30. I'm not sure the exact times, but essentially what we did was solve the problem just by processing at a particular time of day, which is not the most reliable thing because they were frequently late. The other thing is that there was no way in their system to know you could tell that a file was there, but you did not know if a copy was still in progress. So they might be copying, um, you know, tens of megabytes or hundreds, of, you know, enormous files, and you've got no idea of knowing, has this actually finished copying across? And they basically, there was no way that they could tell us when, when the document had, had finished copying. So where a message queue would fit in really well there is the, proce the software process that they got to copy the documents, essentially when it was done, if it had basically fired a message up to a message queue, we could have then been notified, hey, we're done, it's all there, good to go. That would have been much more reliable because we wouldn't have had the risk of copying a partially completed document across, which caused all kinds of havoc and basically had to start again. The other thing is that it would be that it would be actually be a much more responsive process that the bank could get their stuff out much quicker because we wouldn't have to build in these artificial delays to allow for 
time of, of things to copy, that type of problem. Um, likewise over here, basically, once we sent the PDF to them, if we basically had been able to let notify them via me a message queue saying, we're done, everything's copied across, they could have started printing right at that time, instead of waiting for one o'clock in the morning when they would start printing stuff, just because by that time, everything was supposed to be there, which 98% of the time it was, but 2% of the time it wasn't. So you had these, these kind of issues that could have been solved quite easily by, by revising architecture. However, Company X is remarkably, um, I think intransigent would probably be the best word. Um, they were quite difficult to work with. Um, and I won't make any comments about the bank. So that, that, um, um, this is actually, this is um, a, a much simpler use case. Um, I've got, a, actually this is a FileMaker client and what we're doing is they're basically uploading MP3 files to an S3 bucket and we've got a FileMaker interface that views, well, it doesn't view, but it listens, it, it, it basically has, a, a, they, can, they can listen to the files, There's, they, 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 they encode the files with a whole load of metadata in FileMaker. So what we're doing at the moment is basically, you sort of, they upload the files to the S3 bucket. Every now and then when they do the upload, they basically run a process that goes in from FileMaker, goes and queries S3, and it downloads from S3 everything that is not, so it doesn't download the files, but what it does is it, it requests everything that is in the bucket, and it basically checks all these files, matches up. But yes, you raise your eyebrows because it's a, <laughs> There are a couple of better ways to do it, but that's what uh, that's kind of what we had initially implemented. So anyway, it's slow. Once they once they've got sort of ten thousand files or more, it's starting to get like to be a fair volume of data to chunk through, and it's just um, it's just kind of a hassle. So the much better approach would be to do this something like this. Basically, we um, I'll be showing actually an example of sort of how this can work. So we upload MP3 file into the AIA, the AWS S3 bucket. The S3 bucket is configured to send notifications. Uh, basically, the notification is sending it to um, the message queue, and then the FileMaker system, when it opens, can actually quite easily just query the message queue, saying, "Are there any new files?" Because what we end up with is one message per file that is added. The other benefit of this is that actually if they delete a file, that also generates a message in the message queue so we can know that the file that is present in FileMaker has been deleted on S3 and we can uh, deal with that as appropriate. So that's a considerably simpler, well not simpler, <laughs> but it's a, it's, it's a better, much more robust approach to, um, to tackling that problem. Is it the back end of the Shazam? <laughs> no, it's not. It's um, <laughs> it's um, it's a music company in London. Um, so they've got they've got the, they've got like a lot of uh, they've got a lot of audio clips of stuff they've done, uh -huh. sort of this big library of stuff they've done over the years, and they they previously just used to keep it on a file server. Or actually, well, I say file server. Actually, given it's a very small company, it's quite likely it was sitting on somebody's computer somewhere, and then they had a the guy had written a FileMaker database, and when they tagged it, basically someone had to sort of find and listen to the song, and then they was tagged with what instruments are on it, you know, what kind of is it upbeat, downbeat, you know, what genre, all that type of stuff. So, what I'd actually like to do now, yes. So you have this queue, and my understanding is that when a queue is uh, a message has fulfilled its purpose and all subscribers have been handled, it just gets deleted. Is that correct, or does it live on? Um, in this case, okay, what, what this is doing is this is using um, Amazon SQS, and in the case of SQS, uh, a message will, will live on until deleted or until sort of some time passes. So if FileMaker were to crash and you have to sort of rebuild a transaction history, you could replay 
messages from some point in time say, I need to pull everything since last Tuesday again because my database has been filling up. You could, but there's there's probably well no, honestly, there are definitely better ways of doing that. There are there are other systems that are more um, event based views that can that can do that. I think is it Kinesis from Amazon that does that. But essentially, um, yeah, that there there are more architectures now where you have essentially a stream of events and you would be able to reconstruct the state of anything at any point in time from the event stream. But a message queue is, that's not really its intended purpose. Um, because the thing is, in this case, what we do is once we read the message and we process it in FileMaker, then what we do is we basically fire a message back to us, QS <coughs> saying, okay, we're done, delete it. So it is deleted from the queue? It is deleted from the queue. Now the other thing that happens with SQS, and this is configurable from the queue, is that if we had two or three instances of FileMaker all querying the same queue, which is sort of a realistic kind of scenario, when the message is read, or when the message is initially read, it becomes invisible to other con message consumers for a period of time. Uh, I think the default is something like 15 seconds, but I'm not certain on that. That's configurable. So what that does is that basically means that the consumer would have you know, 15 seconds to do whatever it does and then turn around and delete it. If they don't do it in that time, then it will become visible again to other consumers. Unless you have PubSub set up and they've subscribed to their own copy of the stream. That would, that would actually be using, um, actually Amazon's simple notification service is more aimed at that particular scenario than the simple queue service. They're quite similar. Fundamentally, the difference there is that simple queue service is intended for uh, a pull approach where consu message consumers will pull messages from the queue, whereas a simple notification service, basically, it receives an incoming, uh, something is added, a message is added, and that basically then immediately distributes it. So that can distribute it to a queue, it can distribute it, it can send email, uh, SMS, all it can be distributed in a number of ways. So Amazon's got a couple of different tools that sort of can fit together to, to do those different scenarios. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so the, um, yeah, because that was one of the things I was wondering initially with, with SQS was that it didn't seem, I was wondering about that, like how do we prevent things from getting reprocessed and essentially the way you prevent it from getting reprocessed by the consumers is you delete it. Do you need to block it as well or is that staying around? The bucket, uh, the, the upload yeah. Bucket. Okay. The the bucket stays around. So the the bucket is basically an Amazon S three storage bucket. Actually, what I'll do is I'll show you an example of adding adding files to the storage bucket, and then you can see the messages coming through. So I'll actually run through the example in a a moment. Um, yeah. So that's a that's an S three storage bucket. So that that is persistent. Then any number of files can get dumped in there. Each one of them. I've only conf the one I've got the example. I've only configured it to do two events: that and a, uh, that a file has been added or a file has been deleted. <coughs> Though there are other other events as well that can um, trigger the addition of a queue. Um, yeah. So the other th uh, that gets us is because we we can see the creation and deletion. We'll know that we can know if files have been deleted. But we've also got their information like when it was when it was added or deleted, uh, which um, which AWS user did it, uh, a number of things like that. So you can build up a bit of an audit trail and things like that. Um, this is I don't have this example sort of running here to show you, but I'll just talk you through it. In this case, 
very, starts off very similar. We're uploading a video file, um, a video PDF, whatever, into a bucket. Essentially, it then gets added to a queue for processing. Then we've got sort of EC2 instances that do processing, so converting the PDF to an image, converting the images to uh, grayscale, the right size, all that kind of that kind of basic stuff. When the process to get dumped into an output bucket, that basically then is configured to send a message to another queue, and then that queue basically, again, EC2 instances that would run the, um, the machine learning processes on that, and then basically get adding the, adding the results into um, Amazon uh, RDS, which is their um, essentially the hosted database service for SQL Server or, or MySQL. Um, and the kind of neat thing is that actually I, I quite like the approach of adding like the configuring the S3 buckets to do that because it's kind of built in and um, the code to, to add stuff to S3, I mean, it's really simple, but because the adding, sending message to a queue is just a configuration option essentially in S3, it means there's big parts of this that don't really require anything in the way of code. <clears throat> Though this chunk and that chunk, <laughs> there's more than enough there. So, um, yeah, as I said, this was going to be sort of a probably a 30 minute demo, but uh, what I'll do is I'll just kind of summarize, then I'll show you the demo of what I did in, um, in S3 and how, how I configured the S3 bucket. So essentially, the Sorry, just just on that last slide, the I just not quite got it. Is, is the image processing taking place on the original S three bucket, or is it data being taken to the image processing based on the queue information? I'm, I'm not quite. Really okay, sure. so actually, the diagram, yeah, the diagram could be more clear. Okay, what <laughs> um, actually what we're doing is we're sending a message. We're, from the S3 bucket, basically it's containing, it's containing a bunch of image files. We send a message to the queue, actually the image processing receive, are receiving the message from the queue, but what they're doing is they are actually they're loading, taking from, they're taking yeah, the yeah, files okay. from S3. Processing it, then putting it in. Processing it. Up so yes. Message. So this is what happens when you do a diagram 15 minutes before a <laughs> talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, essentially, so yes, so there's, there's kind of a parallel. Um, I mean, essentially, I suppose this is really kind of like the movement of sort of the, the more the metadata about what needs to be done. Whereas, yeah, the... It's the, effectively the trigger to then pull... pull yeah, the yeah. That's the founding of Sorry? Where's the farm your server and all this? Is that yeah. the like the in this one? It's reading the SQL. Uh, in this one, the, uh, the file maker is basically providing, um, providing a user interface on some stuff that is not on this diagram. But essentially, the heavy lifting is all outside. done mostly there and there. And that's basically being done in EC2 as opposed to using anything written as opposed to using the Amazon services because the Amazon services don't do quite what I want. And, um... What OS are you running on the instance? Those? What, what OS are you running on the instance? They're Linux. They're like so. Yeah. I, I mean, that doesn't really matter. Just like whatever is, whatever they give us that can run the, the Python code. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> Um, and I'm not sure that using SageMaker and basically having Amazon <coughs> having the keys to everything that you're doing is the best idea. Because if it actually did end up being something that actually was valuable, I suspect. But I don't know if I 100% trust them. <laughs> anyway, um, so what I'll do is I'll just really quickly show you um, the demo. So if I go... Yeah. 
we were originally going to have a rabbit MQ demo as well, but we're uh, not. So, so, um, yeah, so queue. So I've got um, a number of message queues here. I've got a Malmo S3 queue. If I look at that, um, I think at the moment we've got no messages. Yeah, no messages in that at the moment. We've got um, our S3 bucket that's got a few files. And if, in terms of configuration, if I go under, um, actually I should probably ask, is, is, is everyone here familiar to some extent with um, the Amazon uh, console and configuring? To, I mean, to some extent? Yeah. Not necessarily an expert, yeah. but have you, have you all seen it before? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I just realized before I charge ahead, <laughs> I should ask the question. Okay, so um, essentially in, in yeah, Amazon S3 in buckets, I've just drilled down into the bucket, and if you scroll down, what you've got is you've got a section down here called event notification. And um, what I've done is I've, I've added one called Malmo S3 demo, um, where basically we can all object create events and all object removal events are sent to an SQS queue. We basically, the destination we would select a queue that we, we've got in our account. And the create event no notification essentially, you, know, you give it an event name, um, prefix suffix. So you can see that you can, what you can do is you can track the event type, sort of object creation, you know, put post copy, object removal, object restore, uh, object ACL events will be around security. Sorry, yes? So you set up a queue first, yeah? That's correct, yeah. Step one, you well, actually, I just, create a queue. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so step one, we'd create a queue first. Yeah. Um, it doesn't support uh, FIFO queues for this particular purpose, but it will tell you that when you try to configure it that way, because it, what, that's what made sense to me, so that's how I configured it, and then I tried to try to set it up and just basically said, you can't do that, you've got the wrong type of queue, so then I went back, deleted the queue, added a new queue that was the right type, came back, so I mean, that took like five minutes, but okay. it's, um, yeah, so you can see we've got replication, but also object lifecycle events, so if you're um, using S3 uh, lifecycles where uh, files that are, are old or haven't been read for a certain length of time get moved to a cheaper class of storage uh, that takes longer to recover, you can actually get notification on that so you would be able to have track which. Um, is that for uh, the Amazon CLI for backing up file files rather than control how many files we put on the server? You just push everything and use the lifecycle um, just to maintain a seven day or something. Yeah, yeah, and, and again, it's going to be less expensive. Yeah, so the destination, essentially, you um, um, basically, yeah, we said SQS queue, and um, then we would uh, choose, choose the queue. So I'm actually not going to change that live because that is a guarantee that it is not going to work. So um, you'll just have to trust me that ones I've done that and it, it's worked. So I've got the files there. So if I were to now, um, let's say I'll just grab a couple of screenshots. Just upload those to Amazon. Okay, so those are now, those screenshots have all been uploaded into my S3 bucket. If I now go back and look at my queue, and refresh it. I don't believe this. <laughs> okay, I was a little bit too quick. <laughs> so yeah, so we've got five um, five messages available there um, from the from the upload. I just I just for a second I was just like. 
I've done this dozens of times in the last 24 hours. How could this not work? <laughs> um, okay, so if I come back in here now, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to one of those objects. Um, sorry, where is delete? Yeah, here. So if I grab two of those actions, yeah. Yeah. click. I have to click on the delete button. <laughs> okay. Type permanently delete before it lets me. Okay, so we do that. Now if we go back to our Q, give that a second. Let's refresh that again in a moment. You'll see we've now got seven, seven messages in the queue. So for the deletion. Um, okay, so now we can actually, if I drill down here, in the queue, if you say send and receive messages, if I say poll for messages, then you can see the messages kind of coming in. And you'll see the receive count is now one. It's not actually doing anything with them, but and if we drill down, we've got sort of our JSON um, event body. Now, um, that's actually one thing I found, and it's probably something stupid that I was doing, but when I when I queried the um, queried the um, the SQS API directly via curl, it um, it seemed to be really really insist on giving back XML, not JSON, um, which um, is probably just something I was doing. I probably wasn't setting the um, one of the headers correctly, but. I did mess around with it for, for, for a few minutes trying to get it to work and it seemed really, really keen on XML for some reason, which was kind of annoying. So what I'm about to show you actually, I've written in Python and it's actually part of the same API that I used in my prior talk, but in FileMaker, if I look here, you'll see that I've got a list of message queues. Actually what I'll do is I'll just, uh, I delete all those, if I delete my message queues, delete all, go to scripts, list queues, basically that's queried the API, that's retrieved all my message queues, and we were using the Malmo S3 queue, so if I get message, That's basically retrieved this. And so we can see in this case, we can see up here we've got, um, what I've basically done with this is that I'm just creating a new record. I'm using auto enter calculations from the message body to actually get the fields that I'm interested in. So we've got the object key, which corresponds to the file name with a few minor changes. So I like the plus signs and the spaces, but it's effectively got the, the AWS region and you can see in this case that we've got the object removed, it was deleted. So the thing is that it's not a FIFO queue, so we don't necessarily know which order those messages are going to come back to us. You've got a CLI installed on that, or are you just use the code directly with S3? Um, no, I've uh, basically what I'm doing is, let's see if this, um, yeah, that's not, um, for some reason, my for some reason PyCharm is very unhappy with the dual monitors. Uh, uh, yeah, um, no. Uh, essentially, it's um, it's it's an API that I've written. In, it, no, it's an API that I've written in oh. Python that is talking to the to to Amazon. Okay. Um, on Windows, we're installing the CLI specifically on the Windows, and then we're calling the commands, the batch files, and then it's communicating directly. CLI, the Amazon CLI, 
bucket. Yeah, that that would get you that would get you the the same sort of effect as I've got here. But what I'm doing is I'm basically using curl to talk to my Python API, which is in turn talking to the Amazon API. <laughs> So, um, the, and, and to be honest, the reason I've done that was that actually most of what I'm trying to do actually here, frankly, was around the area of the Python APIs. So that's the part that I was actually primarily interested in. FileMaker is basically being used as a quick interface to look at it because it's just something that I know. So, yeah, so um, we've got the bucket, the bucket name. Um, deletion. We could have other information, sort of like you can see, like the owner identity. Um, you can see the things like the IP address that triggered the deletion. So there's a bunch. Of, so there is other information in there that um, that we can get. Now, in most cases, that message um, is giving us a bit of data. But actually, at this point, what we probably would want to do would be that in our FileMaker script now go and do more processing. So now we would go and like find out more, inf we would now go and find out more information about that file. But what this has done is it's told us that file has been added at this date and time, and now we can do whatever we want to um, with it. So that's kind of, anyway, that um, basically is sort of, anyway, that just gives you a bit of a, a bit of an idea of how uh, an example, um, and actually, I, I yeah, I, I'm I quite like that approach. The, um, the on the on the on the addition of the um, triggering triggering the messages from S3 like that. That's yeah, we're yeah, because essentially what we're what we're doing is we're basically um, we're we're. We're grabbing videos from Zoom and other sort of APIs, and um, basically those are kind of going actually, yeah, into either Wasabi or S3, depending on um, depending on what we're going to do with them. But then they do a lot of processing after that. What, what sort of maximum scale do you think this will tolerate? Like, if you have a thousand messages a day, is that fine? Is it overwhelmed with a million messages a day? Or where's the sort of limit of FileMaker's ability to ingest messages? Of course, I don't have an answer for you, but I think you're quite right. The, the limit is FileMaker's ability to ingest the messages and the processing. It's not the capacity of the message yeah, queues. Yeah, sure, Amazon can go for days. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the capacity of the message queues is, I mean, all of them. Is, uh, is is vast. Um, um, but you're not worried about hitting a ceiling anytime soon? No, I'm not. No. No, because we're not going to be processing millions of millions of things. Um, if we ended up processing thousands of things a day, I'd probably be fairly happy. Um, having not worked out pricing yet, but <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> just <laughs> just a suspicion. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but it's it's it it does seem quite quick. Um, uh, uh, but but that doesn't answer your question. Um, and I think really, I think that the the getting the message from with the filemaker. Um, if you're going to be processing it afterwards, that processing is probably going to take longer than, than getting the message, which is essentially going to be like a, a curl query to Amazon. So however long that normally takes. Oh, I would say the one thing that I've noticed here <coughs> is that basically if you use get message and the queue is empty, it, um, if I grab to say get message on a queue that's got nothing in it, so my new queue. It um, it's gonna it's basically gonna sit there and think about it until until it times out, or it's gonna keep on trying. Actually, I'm not quite certain what which it's doing. I need to check that. It may just be trying again and again and again and again. I suspect it is long polling until um, until a timeout. But that's the only thing I've noticed here that sort of. 
So I've not quite worked out what's going to be the best way to handle that. Um, probably to not return anything to FileMaker or probably to... <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I'll think about that anyway. So... Um, Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, the timeout is adjustable in in um, in my code, um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm still not sure exactly what the best way is going to be to handle that. Um, so, but I think that some of those use cases, like for example, the music company, um, they know when they've added files. So what I could do is basically just simply, once they've added the files, then say process them now, and that would be fairly quick. So, uh, yes? Uh, did you find any value of classifying the messages? Like, what group of unique messages or you know, just that would that, you know, fulfill any purpose of this stuff? Um, you could do sort of so different message systems handle that kind of stuff differently. Yeah. Um, Amazon's is called Simple Queue Service because it is fairly simple compared to some of the other systems. So, integrated. So, well, it's also simpler in terms of the feature set. So if you've got something like um, rabbit message queue, so I've got this running, I've got rabbit MQ running in, um, running in a Docker container here. Um, and it's got a much more elaborate feature set. So where it's got, it's got channels and exchanges. Oh, so what you can do, that, that gives much more power in terms of saying who gets which messages. So if you were running a system, for example, that was a call center system and like distributing calls, you could then, you could classify calls by, so when I did a call system, call center system a few years ago, they had a lot of rules like um, if the customer, if the customer basically was asking about more than 50,000 pounds of whatever it was, none of the junior salespeople were allowed to call them they basically weren't even allowed to like just like go. They would get fired if they spoke to the guy. <laughs> those, those ones had to go to the senior salespeople who were Perfect done. Example. Example. Yeah. So um, the junior salespeople got to speak to the people who had very little money to invest. So if they messed up the call, it didn't matter that much. But so you can do it. It's something you can do. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. Would you use Rabbit and Q or family to family gap communication because the, the good reason for using the Amazon is it's in the pipeline, it's easy to look up to the bucket, but if there's everything appearing, it will trigger off a queue. You could do that in Rabbit and queue as well, but it will just take more time and use the connector somehow. Yeah, I, I'm not sure because connecting to Rabbit MQ, um, I know they've got an API, but I've seen, I saw some, just some on, on Stack Overflow, there were several people saying that their API is really more intended for testing and not for using for production. So a lot of the stuff I've seen for RabbitMQ, basically you would use, say, the native client in, in Node or Python. Um, I mean, actually, you could integrate through a web viewer, like writing, writing JavaScript. Um, but I think that, yeah, somebody was saying that, that the API and using curl wasn't they provide it was something they provided but they didn't really recommend it as a serious means of integration okay. so, so then, but I'm, I'm, you, I'll be quite honest I don't have enough experience on that to actually what would you have queuing between public services uh, public what would your queue per queue service be they're not to well be honest, I'll probably <laughs> what I'll probably do I'd probably go with SQS because it's it's kind of ubiquitous and everybody seems to have an Amazon account and um, it's there's no administration one because one of the things with rabbit MQ is basically you're you're now dealing with a um, you're now dealing with administering another server unless you use one of the hosted services so there are um, cloud services that provide uh, message queuing as a service. But the other thing there is that Amazon with SQS does that and Amazon is effectively free up to really big volumes for, for queuing systems. 
which I presume is because they know that's linking you into their ecosystem even more. Um, so, um, yeah. I've not really touched on using it to link file maker systems to file maker systems, but the place I used that, the other firm where I used to work where we had in an internal project management system in FileMaker and then we had a supplier portal that was sitting outside the firewall and then we were sort of what we did was we had FileMaker kind of reaching out. This was written before the data API. So what it was doing was uh, every hour it would kind of reach out um, triggered by the internal system on a robot machine reaching out to bring in any any updates. but. Actually, yeah, a, a queuing system could just mediate between the two. Basically, it could just send a message saying, hey, John Smith has updated their prices for this product. Go get that then. That would be, that would be far more efficient. And it wouldn't require... Because one of the big things we... When I worked at that company, my, my former boss had worked at GCHQ, so security was kind of high on the list of... So um, they were not keen on holes and firewalls and... Um, things so anyway, um, any other yes yeah so there's also a notification service and so that's not really the queuing but if you want a notification when something is added to the queue then you need another service uh, uh, or, or yeah well actually now of course what Amazon has done is they've made it pretty simple to um, to link the two yeah. so you can uh, Sorry, it was very late at night when I looked at that. <laughs> but but essentially, yeah, you can you can you can also add in SNS, simple notification service, yeah. to kind of the chain of so when something comes in the queue, just it, let the customer know or some. Yeah, exactly, and that's designed for kind of broadcast messages at scale rather. So I think again, it comes down to kind of the push versus pull yeah. type of idea. Yeah. So any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for uh, listening to me.